Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brenton Brown. I am the uh, Director of Public Policy and Community Affairs here for the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's small business webinar regarding the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and also the Paycheck Protection Program. CMA was established in 1993 to be a catalyst for socioeconomic change for the state's ethnic minority communities. As such, we work to ensure that all ethnic minority residents of the state of South Carolina are treated equitably and achieve economic prosperity through sociocultural awareness, collaboration, policy change, and research. In accordance with our mission to uplift communities, we have identified the importance of connecting minority communities to economic resources during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is our belief that with the right knowledge and guidance, the state's minority communities, and especially the businesses, can prosper during this difficult economic time. Helping us to facilitate today's session are two members of the U.S. Small Business Administration's Small Business Development Center program. This is a program that is designed to provide management assistance to current and prospective small business owners. SBDCs offer one-stop assistance to individuals and small businesses by providing a wide variety of information and guidance in central and easily accessible branch locations. Our speakers for today's sessions are for today's session are both experienced business professionals. First, we have Mr. Jim Johnson. He is the region director at the South Carolina Small Business Development Centers, South Carolina State University region, which is located in Orangeburg, South Carolina. He is an entrepreneur that has owned and operated a medical supply company. He was a restaurateur, and he currently owns a property management company. He is a graduate of the College of Charleston, Claflin University, and the South Carolina Economic Development Institute. He is also an adjunct instructor in business at Claflin University and South Carolina State University. Also joining us today, we have Ms. Bernita Platt. She is a consultant at the Small Business Development Center located at Coastal Carolina University where she assists new and existing entrepreneurs with the startup and growth of their businesses. She is a graduate of the University of South Carolina and Coastal Carolina University, where she earned a BS in accounting and an MBA respectively. In addition to consult her consulting capacity, she also is a teaching associate at Coastal Carolina University, where she has taught core business courses. And she also has a background in banking and taxation. Uh, at the conclusion of their presentation, they will answer any questions that you may have regarding the Paycheck Protection Program. However, if you would like to write those questions down and submit them to the chat box, we will get to them after the main presentation is done. So without further delay, I present to you Mr. Jim Johnson and Ms. Bernita Platt. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the invite. Uh, again, uh, we had a wonderful time uh, speaking uh, to you guys earlier, I think a couple months ago when this is all starting up, and we really didn't know where where everything was going. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm glad to say that we know a lot more now uh, and, and um, happy to be able to share that with you. Let me try to share my screen here. Okay. So, yeah, thank y'all. And you did a great introduction there um, for both the SBDC and myself and Bernita. And uh, thanks, Bernita, for joining us. Um, thank you guys for having me. I hope you can hear me okay. Yep, I can hear you. Awesome. And uh, also, so Bernita has been doing this for a while. And uh, <clears throat> she actually is at Coastal Carolina. Uh, outside of Myrtle Beach. Uh, so she's actually the closest to uh, the folks, I believe, that uh, are mostly on this this webinar, <clears throat> as well as Janet Graham, who's the area uh, director for Myrtle Beach. But Janet could not make it with us today. She is on vacation. Uh, we all deserve one, uh, this for sure, after all this uh, pandemic stuff. Um, but basically how, how I'm going to proceed with the uh, presentation here, uh, Bernita, is I have a presentation. I'll go through it and please jump in if I miss something. Uh, there is a lot to both of these programs. 
And, um, you know, if you feel, if you feel that I've left something out, please jump in and, um, you know, let us know. Uh, so I'm going to go, uh, over the, uh, idle program and the payroll protection program <clears throat> and then of course uh, like was stated we'll answer some questions at the end and there are a lot of complexities to especially the PPP so there could be endless amount of questions we may or may not be able to answer all those questions for you but we'll try our best and if we can't answer them today we can find an answer for you uh, you know through our network and the SBA and just an agenda uh, about the SBDC. You did a wonderful job of explaining what the SBDC does. Uh, we're going to go over the idle econo uh, economic injury disaster loan. Uh, idle reconsideration, as many of you may have experienced or know someone uh, who has been turned down for the idle grant or loan. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And the payroll protection program and PPP forgiveness which is the big one of the big topics uh but it's also probably what we have the least amount of information on as far as how each bank will will proceed with forgiveness <clears throat> but we we were just on a webinar with uh several bankers and um they kind of gave us the inside track on their ppp forgiveness so we should be able to elaborate a little bit more on that just some information uh, about the sbdc uh you know here are a few metrics over the last five years. We have worked with uh, over 21,000 small businesses in South Carolina. Uh, we have we have, have 21 locations in South Carolina and about a little over probably 50 consultants now after COVID because we were able to get an SBA grant, um, a COVID grant, and we we're able to hire a lot more folks to try to help during these times. So we have a lot more uh, resources available. And I'm happy to say that in my office in Orangeburg at South Carolina State, I'll have a new employee coming on this week who is a banker. He just retired from banking or uh, came out of banking, I should say, for the last 15 years. So he'll be a great asset. And he actually processed many of these PPP loans. <clears throat> he was just at First Citizens Bank. Uh, so he'll be a great resource uh, for that. And I don't know if y'all know, but we also uh, help with government contracting. Uh, it's a big part of what we do. Uh, last five years, over three billion uh, in assistance for government contracts. So let's jump into why we're here. Uh, the idle product first. Uh, so if y'all can recall, you know, rewind back several months when all this happened. The first. <clears throat> the very first product that came out to assist small businesses was the idle loan. And this idle loan is not new. It's been around for a very long time. The SBA during a disaster, a typical disaster like hurricanes in South Carolina, tornadoes, uh, they have the idle loan, which is designed to help folks. Uh, but what usually happens, Hurricane comes, it hits Myrtle Beach or Charleston. You know, those areas are declared a disaster area by the governor. And <clears throat> the SBA and FEMA come in and they set up shop in those areas, um, Charleston, Myrtle Beach. Um, and then people are processed through those offices. You know, SBDCs help. A lot of times they are at SBDCs. Uh, and they process the people through these idle loans. Well, this just happened to be a nationwide disaster, which is unprecedented. And SBA was not prepared for this. So they basically had to invent this in a matter of weeks for federal government to develop a brand new program in weeks is, is pretty amazing. Uh, so a lot of bumps that had to be worked out, <clears throat> but it was, it was, uh, it was launched and uh, soon after it was launched, they changed it uh, to a streamlined application. And let's get back over here, <clears throat> which was one of the, in every iteration that came out of the idle loan uh, was a little improvement. Really, they, there's just been 
two iterations of the idol. You got the first, and then they quickly changed gears and made a, a streamlined application process and didn't ask for near as much information. <clears throat> the, the SBA actually hired on, I don't know how many thousands of people uh, to process all these uh, IDA loans. And they also brought in FEMA to help process. Uh, just thousands of people were hired to, <clears throat> to manage this. I'm sure y'all understand the scale of it. So what was the IDA loan? Uh, <clears throat> the funds first came from the U.S. Treasury. Um, it's uh, no cost to apply for this loan. You actually apply at, uh, I had the site up here, uh, covid19relief.sba.gov. Or if you can't remember that, uh, you could just go to sba.gov and you know, you'll get right around to it. <clears throat> no cost. There's no obligation to take the loan if you're offered the loan. Uh, that was a big part of it. And then the loan actually has two components. Um, you have the loan itself and then you have an advance um, that's available as well. Uh, but there's no obligation. You, you could apply for this loan. If they offered you something, you don't have to take it. Uh, the maximum unsecured loan is 25000 So anything under 25000 if they offer you that, they're not going to ask for collateral. Uh, but if it goes over 25000 they're going to want collateral. And the collateral is non-real estate. So they, they might take, you know, equipment, um, other items like that. Uh, so it's, <clears throat> they just basically put a, you know, a blanket, uh, um, lean on a universal lean on the, uh, equipment and stuff like that, which should not affect really future loans, uh, according to bankers we just talked to. Um, now the debt itself would, um, because you owe that money and, uh, you know, that's going gonna to come up as a, as a debt on your liabilities. <clears throat> so this, uh, also the idle loan can be deferred for 12 months and there's an advance up to $10,000 that is available. So basically, you know, you come on hard times, you need, uh, uh, assistance from the SBA and <clears throat> the federal government. You apply directly to the SBA. Uh, it's pretty simple application. Um, and when you do this, they give you the option to uh, apply for the advance or grant, essentially a grant up to $10,000. Uh, so if you do uh, select that option, uh, you will likely get uh, the way they calculate it is you get $1,000 per employee. So if you're a sole proprietor, it's just you uh, or self-employed, you basically get a thousand dollars. Maybe if it's you and five other employees, uh, six thousand dollars. So it just depends. But the cap is ten thousand. You can't get more than ten thousand uh, dollars. And the way that's been shaking out with uh, from the beginning is, <clears throat> you know, folks apply for the idol, and this doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason about when the loan um, proposal comes or offer comes versus when the grant is given. But we do know that a lot of times what happens is the grant just shows up in your account one day. Uh, and that could be 30 days after you apply. We've seen more than 30 days. We've seen people that still haven't gotten it. And, uh, what, what generally happens is you'll just, see the grant just pop up in your account because you'll have to put your account information, you know, in the application. And, um, then at some point you'll get a, um, offer from the SBA and they have their different calculations about exactly how they come up with how much of a loan they'll offer you. Uh, but it will pop up. And at that point you can kind of make your decision as to whether you want to accept that loan from them or you don't want to accept it. And there's two paths to not accepting it. One is you can contact them and, you know, let them know you don't want to do it, or you can just do nothing. And eventually they'll withdraw the offer, 
automatically. Um, so several different ways you can go there. Uh, I'll go on down here Let's see how much can I borrow up to two million dollars. Uh, these are some of the terms. Uh, pretty good terms. Interest rates 3.75 for a small business, uh, nonprofits and uh, other uh, private nonprofits and uh, other nonprofits is 2.75 percent. 30 year terms. So this is definitely a long term loan. Uh, you don't usually see that in the commercial industry, uh, but they, from a cash cash flow standpoint, they allow you plenty of time to pay it back. And eligible based on the size, type of business, and final financial eligibility is based on the size, type of business, and financial resources. So <clears throat> size, you know, the typical size for SBA standards is under 500 employees, but there are other um, considerations as well, like revenue and things like that. The hospitality industry was exempted a lot of times if they had over 500 employees. Uh, so th there's, there's exclusion to these, but the rule of thumb is under 500 employees. And types of businesses, there are some excluded businesses, uh, you know, gun shops, um, you know, some things that are just on the typical SBA exclusion list. <clears throat> How can I use the funds? Uh, you can use it for, it's basically for working capital, to pay your debts, your rent, your utilities, you know, uh, payroll, accounts payable, any kind of bills uh, that would have been paid had the disaster not occurred. Uh, I've had a lot of questions as to, can I pay it to pay off the mortgage? Um, based on the rules, you would not be able to, you really wouldn't be able to use it to pay off the mortgage. Um, you could use it to make your mortgage payments because those are typical bills you would have had pre-disaster. Um, but, you know, there would be some restrictions, but we don't know, you know, in, in my opinion, we don't know how hard they look really at how you spend the money after you get it. Uh, the main thing is they just say it's for working capital. <clears throat> so yeah, more with uh, eligibility here. Uh, small businesses under 500, sole proprietors uh, can apply, uh, cooperatives uh, can apply, and uh, travel small business in some of these other uh, categories. Uh, agricultural cooperatives, uh, agricultural businesses, they were excluded at first, uh, but now any agricultural business can apply. And businesses with more than 500, as I said, you know, if it hits certain SBA standards, uh, standards, they can actually apply as well. Something that's a little different here is that uh, nonprofits, uh, 501C, uh, 501Cs, Ds and Es can apply. And uh, some other type of faith based organizations uh, can apply as well. These are a little, little unusual because normally they're just business, but FEMA would handle a lot of stuff, but FEMA's not you know, this is not being run through FEMA. <clears throat> Some ineligible entities, um, anything that's an illegal activity, of course, uh, principal with 50% more than 60 days to delinquent on child support. That's a big one for being, um, uh, you know, rejected uh, if you are behind on child support. Um, it says here agricultural enterprises are ineligible, but that's no longer the case. They are now eligible. Um, you have some of these other uh, type uh, industry types that are excluded, gambling, lobbying, um, local municipal governments uh, cannot apply. They have other sources of income that they can apply for. <clears throat> so what's the primary criteria for approval? How do they decide? you know, if you are uh, approved for this loan or not. Well, the first they do, thing they do is check your credit. Uh, so whenever you submit the application, they check your credit and then it goes to some other underwriting process, which is really a mystery uh, to us. And they also will not disclose, the SBA will not disclose what the credit score, what, where's the threshold for the credit score? They don't disclose that. Um, so, you know, 
uh, it's just something that they're not telling us. So, but they do check the credit. Um, and so that's one way they proceed uh, with, with the underwriting. Um, also ability to repay the SBA loan. You know, they generally have, um, if you file tax returns, you know, they, they have access to those things and, and they can try to, you know, figure how much you can, you know, repay based on that. Uh, a lot of people and a lot of businesses, uh, whenever you first apply it, they, they really don't ask you for that much information. Uh, basically gross sales and cost of goods sold. And that's about it. Um, as far as, you know, uh, financial information. Uh, so how they access a lot of these underwritings is still a little bit of a mystery. Um, so we, we talked about the fact that uh, you can use the funds on working capital, some ineligible uses of the loan, uh, dividends and bonuses, uh, disbursements to owners, unless for performance of services, uh, repayment of stockholder and principal loans, uh, expansion of facilities for acquisition of fixed assets, repairs and replacements of physical damages, and refinancing long-term debt. You're not supposed to consolidate debt with it. So these are these are some things. And also, uh, here you go, paying down or paying off loans <clears throat> or owned by other federal agencies, including the SBA. Uh, so if you wanted to pay off your mortgage, uh, you should, can't do that with it, with it. Payment of any part of a direct federal debt, except the IRS obligations. Uh, can't use the relocate or other ineligible uses available, which are online at the website. So if you do go to SBA uh, to apply, uh, you'll come to a site. This is actually the first page of the site. And if we go to, um, we go up here. Uh, this is the SBA site. This is where it'll take you to. Um, once you get on there, it gives you several options. Uh, these two are the main ones we're talking about here, which is the PPP and idle. You go to the idle and uh, it's pretty easy. Go to apply here. And this is going to take you to that picture I just showed you. You have to answer some, uh, you have to answer a question about your eligibility verification you know, and then it will let you proceed uh, once all these are are clicked. And, um, you know, then you get to the, the actual um, application and it's pretty simple. Uh, they don't ask too much. You will need your bank uh, information, your routing number, and you'll need your EIN number um, and some other, some other um, you know, type of information like that. Let's see here. <clears throat> so, like I said, they're going to ask you for gross revenues, cost of goods sold. Those are the two financial indicators they'll ask for. You don't always have cost of goods sold either. If you're a service, you know, you would not have cost of goods sold. Um, but you would definitely have gross revenues. If you had no gross revenues, that's going to be a red flag and they're probably going to deny, deny you because you didn't have any sales. Um, and this is for the 12 months prior January 31, or you can use 2019, you know, numbers. Uh, so you got to have some gross revenue. You don't necessarily have to have cost goods sold. Depends on your type of business. Uh, loss, if you're a property manager, uh, if you have lost rents, uh, which you might have to project, uh, depending on when you apply, um, you know, if you're projecting that people aren't going to be able to pay rent, you would put put that in there. Uh, operating expenses for this is for nonprofits only. And other reimbursements uh, uh, that will receive business interruption insurance and stuff like that. Uh, your number of employees, they need that to indicate how much of a grant that you'll receive. So if you have six employees, uh, then they, you should get $6,000. <clears throat> if that includes yourself as well. So there's this, if you go through this application process towards the end, you'll get to this screen. If you want the grant, you have to actually click this uh, indicator 
and select that you would like it. If you don't, they're not going to consider you for it. And once you click that, you know, you have to have your banking information. Uh, they may come back if they offer you a loan, they may come back and ask for additional information. Uh, they may request this to my experience. They have not done that. Uh, but it just depends on the business and maybe their first, um, look at your, uh, you know, your background and whatnot. And, 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 uh, but so they, they may ask you for more information. Bernita, is, how, how's your, the clients that you've worked with, are they mostly just getting the loans or are they just, uh, are they getting asked for more information? No, most of them are, once they get that uh, invitation to create the portal, they're pretty much good to go and they're not asking for any additional documentation from that point. Um, it seems like the advance is the part that's creating the most confusion because it shows up when it shows up and there's really no rhyme or reason, you know, to when that happens. Yep, that's that's pretty much what I've experienced. And this this was made by the SBA. Uh, this particular presentation, uh, they probably made it a little bit earlier on. Uh, so they kept changing and pivoting kind of how they were processing idle, and they're getting more and more lenient as time goes on. <clears throat> so general information: if uh, more funds are needed, applicants can submit supporting documents and request for an increase. So if they offer you, you know, $10,000 and you're like, eh, $10,000, I don't know if that's going to be enough. Then you can, you know, contact them back in and see if they can increase that, that offer. Uh, if less funds are needed, you don't have to accept the whole amount. Usually when they send you the offer, they, it'll be one page, kind of like a dashboard looking thing. And it might say, all right, we're offering you $50,000 and you can go on and you can kind of like move the, uh, uh, the amount back and forth. Um, and you may, you can just take it down to 30,000. You say, I want 30,000 boom. And then, you know, there's other questions you have to answer. Um, but it's pretty simple, uh, but you don't have to take the whole amount. So, uh, we usually tell people, you know, take it because you can always just repay it because you don't know what's going to happen next month. So if they were going to offer you 50,000 and you said, well, I really don't need 50,000. And you said, I'll just take 10,000. Well, what happens? We don't know what's happening this fall. And what if you needed that additional $40,000? <clears> so go ahead and take it because you can always just re repay it if you don't use it. Uh, and the terms are pretty, pretty good 3.75 over 30 years. So your payments are going to be very low anyway, and they're deferring it, uh, for six months, I believe. So, uh, the loan request is denied. The applicant will be given six months in which to provide new information and submit a written request for a reconsideration. So you can be reconsidered if you were denied. There's a process and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So uh, some, some FAQs they put on here. How long will it take uh, before I know that I'm approved for a loan? Um, they say as soon as possible. And I've seen it in the beginning from 30 to 60 days. Um, you know, I haven't, a lot of people hadn't, hadn't applied uh, lately, <clears throat> but um, you can still apply. If a business currently has an SBA backed loan and it fears it will not be able to make payments, what course of action should it take? Um, disaster loans for pre pre previous disasters that are still being paid back will have no, will now have their payments deferred. So, um, it's an SBA back loan. Uh, how does the business define an impact or a loss? I mean, you do need to have some impact to your business. If you're just booming, uh, and that this didn't really affect your business. Maybe you are a mask manufacturer and you're doing really good right now. Well, I mean, there was no economic damage to your business. So you really shouldn't be, um, applying for it. So let's see here. 
reconsideration. So basically, you know, the idols out there, um, it will only go up to, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it can go up pretty high as much as you need. Uh, there's not a lot, you know, like I said, the underwriting is not a lot of uh, information about ex specifically how they decide how much they offer you. But uh, one thing that we have run into, and then I've, we've got a lot of questions about is uh, denials um, in the fact that they haven't seen their advance yet. Um, so we did a webinar yesterday, I believe, um, on reconsideration. So these are some of the reasons that they would deny you or why you may have not been paid if you did uh, submit for the idol. Unsatisfactory credit, I mentioned, they pull your credit and don't know what the credit score is, but you know, if it's low enough, uh, they may not um, approve you. Although, you know, as, as they still have money, they're starting to reconsider that a little bit, I think. So they may lower that threshold and come back and reconsider some people. Um, economic, economic injury is not substantiated. Uh, just like I mentioned before, if your company is really doing good and there was really no injury to your comp uh, company, then, you know, and they basically look at your finances, they may not, you know, fund you. Uh, not eligible due to character reasons. Uh, those character reasons include, um, you know, some of those excluded uh, industry types that we mentioned. Uh, if you're in a gambling industry, uh, they're not going to uh, fund that. Um, if you haven't paid your child support uh, for X amount of days, they're not going to fund that. So there is a list of, of reasons like that. Uh, an applicant requests a change in plans or fails to proceed. Uh, so there's a bunch of little technical reasons when you're going through the process. You know, you don't, you know, dot all your I's or cross all your T's and proceed in the right way. It could cause some issues. Um, not eligible because the applicant is not a small business. You don't fall within the eligibility criteria. You know, it happens a good, good bit of time. Uh, Marty mentioned the child support business activity uh, is not eligible and uh, unverifiable information. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, um, reasons such as uh, if you are uh, not a citizen of the United States, you can actually apply. I mean, you can, you can apply if you're not a citizen, but you may be denied if, cause they'll need additional information. Uh, and like they need to verify your green card or uh, whatever other document, um, you know, that uh, tells why you're here in the United States. But uh, that might be a denial reason. <clears throat> and um, you know, a lot of the times you just need to submit additional information for your reconsideration. Um, looking at your tax, uh, tax returns and, and things like that. Um, getting a copy of the 4506 T that's the IRS form, which allows, uh, the release of your tax returns. Uh, any other reasons you can think of Bernita for reconsideration? No, I think that pretty much, uh, covers it. Unverifiable information. A lot of the time is because you're, bank account. Maybe it's not a business account or maybe you did not put the numbers in correctly um, and tra maybe transpose some numbers. Um, so that's one that that's hung a lot of people up. So just make sure that you're entering your numbers correctly um, and that you are ideally uh, putting in a bank account that is uh, directly correlated to that business. Thanks. Um, yeah, and the idle to me, I mean, everybody should apply for it. Um, you know, it's out there to help and pretty much almost any business is eligible from a sole proprietor, self-employed to a nonprofit and almost everything in between if you're considered a small business. And like I said, you can accept the loan or you don't have to accept it. You can just accept the grant. Uh, so it's pretty flexible and uh, it is open right now. 
uh, until the end of the year. Uh, so it's still up until the end of the year, and who knows, they may extend that even longer. Uh, S, you know, SBA has been known to do that. So that that's the idle loan. So let's go over to another popular program, the Payroll Protection Program. And uh, so the Payroll Protection Program, the PPP or the P3, uh, now the P4, uh, it's got a lot of ways people refer to it. Uh, but the Payroll Protection Program, uh, it actually ended on June the 30th, but it just got extended. Uh, so now they're accepting applications again starting on July the 6th, uh, which is a couple days ago. And they prior prioritized this program and passed uh, the, P the P4, um, passed Congress and was signed by the president. Uh, extended the window for business owners to August the 8th. So you have till August the 8th to apply for this PPP. Um, and they have $135 billion left in the PPP fund right now. Uh, in addition to the extension, P4 will decouple PPPs from the SBA 7A lending program and allow some small business owners to apply for a second PPP loan. So I want to also talk about disclosure, the application, and forgiveness. So first of all, full disclosure, uh, the PPP is a very fluid product uh, that has had four revisions and iterations uh, of the program. And there's been kind of a, the last one was a major revision. Um, when, when they first, <laughs> when they first released PPP, I mean, it was like they released it one night early in the morning and then they were like, all right, the banks are going to process the next day. And that's funny um, because the banks didn't even know the rules at that point. So the banks had to scramble and some of the bigger banks were a little better at getting, getting, you know, their, their products up and being able to accept applications, um, you know, than the smaller banks, but it took probably a week or so, maybe even a couple of weeks before banks could really get into the groove of accepting applications and because they didn't know the rules and they came out with these uh, rules and, and then they kept changing the rules and updating interim, you know, rules. So uh, anyway, it's been interesting uh, to, to follow the PPP. Um, one of the biggest uh, differences in the PPP and the idle is that the idle is a, a direct loan from the government, whereas the PPP is uh, run through the banks and their 7A program. <clears throat> and the 7A is a lending product for the SBA. And basically to, to do a 7A loan, you had to be a certified SBA lender as a bank and you know at the time they rolled that out there were a ton of banks that were not certified SBA lenders so then they had to roll on banks and get them certified so they could actually you know uh, sell the product or or I should say um, work with the product uh, so <clears throat> in the fact that it's more like a guarantee than it is like a direct uh, loan and that has been an interesting approach to getting the money out into the hands of the businesses. I mean, one of the benefits was banks have cash on hand and they can lend it immediately almost. Whereas whenever you filed for the idle loan directly to the government, it would take 30 to 60 days to get you the money. You need it now, you know, because your business is closed, but you got bills that are still coming in. Uh, so the banks were able to get you that money out a lot quicker, but you know, there's a lot of, there were a lot of downsides to it as well. Um, so also let me, uh, advance with the disclosure. So th things are always changing. Um, you know, we can't answer all the questions here right now tonight. So sign up for advising, um, and, uh, check our website, uh, for more updates, but, 
you know, if you're in the Myrtle Beach, Georgetown area, Bernita, uh, Platt, and um, Janet Graham could definitely take care of you. Uh, maybe some time, though, because they are super busy. So many folks are, you know, asking them for help during these times. So, but they'll definitely get to you uh, at some point. Um, so, we also won't go too much into loan forgiveness uh, of the PPP just because that's still evolving. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what is the Paycheck Protection Program? Uh, IDLE came out for um, basically for uh, working capital. The PPP was meant to keep people employed. It was to make your payroll while your business is closed and hopefully, you know, reduce the impact of, and, and of unemployment and folks, you know, just being laid off and hopefully save your business. Um, so the CARES Act funded uh, about $350 billion um, in the 7A lending capacity for small business. <clears throat> a bill was just passed, like I mentioned, to add a $310 billion. Uh, 60 billion is set aside for community banks and credit unions, which are smaller banks. Uh, the PPP provides critical funding to cover payroll, rent, utility costs. That's all it covers. And the maximum loan amount is 2.5% of your average monthly payroll. So that's how you calculate it. And the entire principal and interest of the loan may be forgiven, which is huge. Essentially, that's a grant, right? You don't have to pay it back based on your eight weeks of expenses after you receive the loan, and at least 6% of the forgiven amount must be spent on payroll. That actually used to be 75%, but it was recently changed to 60%. So it gets you some details of the PPP loans. Um, no, no collateral requirements or personal guarantees, uh, which is good. Uh, up to $10 million, uh, you can get up to $10 million for it. A two-year term and amortization, they actually changed that recently. Uh, and I'll go over the updates and changes. 1% uh, fixed rate of interest, uh, very low rate. Uh, no SBA fees and no premium prepayment pen penalties, and all loan payments will be deferred for six months. So, but this is a for, you can get this loan forgiven. So, you know, given that, you know, you shouldn't really have to worry about any of that stuff. But if you ended up spending it on non eligible uh, items, then it becomes a loan, but it becomes a loan with a very low fixed rate in decent terms. Um, wanted to show you all some information on the PP uh, uh, report. So a lot of people ask, you know, where's the money going? Uh, I thought it was interesting. This came from the SBA to us not, not too long ago. Um, this is a summary of their approved lending to date. Uh, it looks like they've made 4.5 million loans and $512 billion is what they've loaned out. Um, let me get down to some of this more, I guess. Uh, these are just the, the types of banks that they lent through. This uh, South Carolina, y'all might be interested in South Carolina. They've made 59,891 PPP loans for 5.6 billion in South Carolina. Of course, we're a little bit smaller of a state. Um, loan size, a lot of people are interested in this. They're like, where's all the money going? Is it going to big business or, you know, or small guys getting the loans? Well, they've done loans under 50,000, uh, 2.9 million of the loans were under 50,000 or $55 billion. So 65% of the number of loans uh, was to small business, very small businesses likely, um, which is only 10% of the overall money. But, uh, you know, that's, it's a lot of loans to small business is, is what they're trying to show. And who, who's lending this money? Of course, your big banks, uh, JP Morgan, Bank, uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo in this area, Truist, <clears throat> are doing most of the activity. And kind of what are the sectors that are getting the money or, or the most money? 
healthcare, um, as you can imagine, uh, construction, manufacturing, uh, accommodations, and food service. Uh, you would think they would be even higher, but I guess these these folks probably um, just require more money. So, in the, the date this was done, six twelve twenty, there was one hundred twenty nine billion left uh, on six twelve. So I thought that was an interesting, you know, report to look at because, uh, you know, people do ask, well, where's the money going? Uh, and of course, uh, the SBA has to be stewards of the money. And I think in the, the reiteration of the last um, PPP, you know, they're trying to get the money out to smaller businesses more, more than uh, as much as possible. So we'll, we'll get into how do you calculate this loan and how much you can get. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, you have to go to a bank to get this loan. So you're going to be dealing with a banker, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what, what the bank is going to ask for is your payroll information, uh, because that's how you calculate uh, how much of a loan you will get. So you, you would basically look at your average uh, payroll over the last 12 months, and you aggregate your payroll 12 months, divide that by the monthly period, uh, which, uh, you know, if you're looking at a year, it'd be 12, about about 12. So you get your average payroll, multiply that by 2.5, add any refinance idle amount. Now I'll get to that, uh, uh, in a second. And, uh, that'll get you your maximum loan amount. You can actually refinance your idle loan into your PPP loan, uh, or a portion of it. Um, if you like. <clears throat> so uh, let's just say, for instance, that your payroll was $1,000 per month. Uh, then for a 12 month period, you know, that would be a total of 12,000 you spent in payroll and then divide that by 12 back to a thousand, multiply that 2.5 and you would have $2,500. So that would be the loan that you would get. $2,500, um, you know, if you spent $10,000 on payroll every month, you know, just add a zero to that, you'd be getting $25,000, uh, for the loan. Um, if you received the idle loan from January 31st to April 1st, and it was used to cover payroll costs, it must be refinanced. So yeah, you remember the idle loan is used for, um, working capital, but part of your working capital is your payroll. So if you actually used a little bit of that money on your payroll, then you'd have to, you could lump it in, uh, to this and, um, you know, it's forgivable in that case, uh, proceeds from any idle advance must be subtracted because it does not have to be repaid. So let's just say that, you know, um, you're getting $25,000, uh, you know, in your, um, in your loan and you got an idle grant of $5,000, then you would get a net $20,000, uh, for the loan. So yeah, you got to subtract that advance out of it. And if you paid any payroll out of the idle, it would be refinanced or lumped into the, uh, to the PPP loan. <clears throat> what qualifies as payroll costs? Uh, payrolls is gross wages plus payment for leave plus payment for employee benefits plus state and local taxes and gross wages is salary plus commissions plus cash tips. Cash tips are calculated on prior records and a reasonable good faith estimate. And at that point I will say, if you look at the over here, you know, you see they've got time sheets, you got documents. You need your, you need your documentation. I would not claim anything that you can't produce a document for. If you can't produce a document for it, then I mean, definitely don't claim it because in the end to be forgiven, you're going to have to start producing documents, um, that show, you know, what your, 
uh, what your what you paid out in wages and, and things like that. What's excluded? Uh, annual individual compensation over a hundred thousand dollars. So once you if you have an employee that makes over a hundred thousand, then anything over that one hundred thousand mark would be excluded. Uh, only wages, commissions, and tips does not include benefits. Um, employees with principal residence outside the U.S. And 1099 employees and independent contractors. That was a big issue. <clears throat> you know, if you have the type of, let's just say you have a barbershop, for instance, and then, you know, the folks are maybe renting chairs from you, or maybe they're just, you know, independent contractors somehow and pay you a portion. Um, you know, if you had 10 people that worked in your barbershop and, you know, they were all, independent contractors, you could only basically count yourself as a sole proprietor, but you couldn't count them. They would have to independently apply for the different uh, programs. <clears throat> so you, can, you can't claim a 1099 person as one of your employees. They are basically self-employed. Um, you can't also, also you can't uh, claim federal employment taxes or withholding uh, anything federal, you know, uh, like uh, Medicare, all that stuff. Uh, you can't claim that. Uh, sick or family leave qualifying for Families First Act credits. Can't use that either. So period to determine average payroll. I talked about this a little bit. Existing business should calculate both tax and trailing 12 month uh, option. Um, so you can use this with an existing business you should use your 2019 tax year. And so whatever you claim for payroll that year, there it is divided by 12. And that's your average. If you were new business, you know, from January 1st to February 29th, um, you know, you would just claim, you know, what you did in that period of time, you had to have been in operation, um, you know, when, when the COVID hit. Uh, so I've come across people who started businesses after January 1st, and they got denied for idle and they never applied for PPP because they never paid a payroll. Um, but you don't, I mean, you gotta have paid a payroll and you have to be making money uh, for the idle. If you didn't have any sales then you're not going to be eligible and seasonal businesses. This, this is a big one because there's a ton of them out there, especially, you know, event, uh, organizers and things like that where their big time was maybe in the spring when they had weddings and uh, different uh, events going on and they made all their money you know maybe between March and June <clears throat> well you can actually just take any consecutive 12 week period and you know come up with that calculation because you know you may be if it's a touristy area you may be uh, not very active over the winter months or uh, down months, uh, depending on where you are. So you can actually calculate based on, you know, your season. Uh, Self-employed people do qualify. Uh, to be eligible, you must meet the following requirements. Got to be in operation on February 15th. Have a self-employment income, independent contractor or sole proprietor. And you have to have filed or will file uh, 1040 with Schedule C for 2019. So you need a Schedule C, which is a you know a business uh, return to show that you had activity in 2019, and it's going to show that you paid yourself in some form or fashion. Um, and the way they they would usually look at it is you take your 2019 net income divided by 12. So you get an average of your net income, multiply that by 2.5. Same thing, any refinance idle amount that you might have received that was allocated towards payroll and you come up with your maximum loan amount. And uh, so this is based on 2019 1040 set schedule C line 31. That's your net profit line. <clears throat> your net income can't be more than a hundred thousand. They'll cap you at that. Um, idols made between, uh, January 31st and April the 3rd that you seek to refinance uh, less the amount of any advance. <clears throat> so basically if you're in business for yourself 
and you didn't necessarily pay yourself payroll. It's just going off, you know, if you're not a corporation and you're, you're not W2, you know, um, which probably wouldn't be in this self-employed situation, you know, you're just going off the net income numbers. <clears throat> so some, um, some updates uh, to the, uh, to the PPP. Uh, borrowers have the option to extend the eight weeks to 24 weeks now. Um, back when I was first talking about it, once, once you get the loan, the PPP loan, initially you had eight weeks to start spending money. Uh, now you have 24 weeks. So they extended that um, for your payroll costs to re re retain and rehire your employees. And one of the big things with forgiveness is uh, you've got to, you got to get your employees back. So if you claim when all this started, you had 10 employees, then, you know, they're basing uh, a lot of stuff on 10 employees. You have to then eventually hire 10 employees. Um, you have a certain amount of time to do that. <clears throat> so if you don't, then that's where your forgiveness is going to start to become an issue. So let me go to the second, this next line first. Uh, used to be you had to uh, spend 75% on payroll. They changed that. You only have to spend 60% of it, of the loan on payroll. The additional 40%, now you can spend on utilities or uh, your mortgage interest or rent payments. <clears throat> If you spend more, if you spend a hundred percent on on payroll, you're fine. You know, you don't, you know, uh, you, it's a minimum sixty percent. Uh, so if you spent, you know, more than that, that's fine. It would still be forgivable. The June thirtieth deadline for penalties and calculations for deductions and workforce has been extended to December thirty first. Okay, so this is the part where you have to rehire your people. So if you had ten, you claim ten, you had ten employees, and that's what you're basing your payroll on. Well, then you need to rehire 10 employees by the end of the year. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be the same employee. Like for instance, some of your employees might have gone on unemployment um, and then they don't want to come back or maybe they moved or maybe it could be a lot of different things. Um, it's not like you have to hire that same employee back, <clears throat> but you do have to hire, if you had an F 10 FTEs, you have to hire 10 FTEs back. Or if you had five FTEs, full-time employees, and five part-time employees, you know, you need five full-times, five part-times. So it just has to be equivalent, and you have to hire those back by the end of the year. Additional exceptions where the bar made good faith effort and can document one of the following situations. The employer unable to rehire former employees or similarly qualify the new employees, or the business when it was an, unable to restore business operation due to federal health guidelines or restrictions related to COVID. So there's some exemptions there or exceptions, extended low loan repayments. So remember back in that earlier slide, you had two years to repay the PPP. If it becomes a loan, now you have five years. So they extended that out uh, still at 1%, uh, which is a great deal. Bars will be eligible for a two year deferral um, of employers, if employers of social security payroll taxes. So you can defer your payroll taxes to your social security payroll taxes. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing that was excluded from being able to, you know, get the loan for. Um, so now that they've actually made a deferral that to help you out a little bit uh, more. So some uh, general best practices for the application, always start with the bank you have a relationship with. Like I said, PPP, you have to work with a banker and uh, they have to be a participating lender. Always go where you have a relationship first. Uh, if, and, and honestly, most banks, a lot of the banks are not accepting PPP applications anymore. And some of them may accept PPP applications only if you're one of their existing customers. So that's, that's become an issue. It was an issue several times during the PPP um, program. And it's an issue now. 
Uh, so, because some people, you know, the PPP ended on June 30th, and then it got approved to be extended through August 8th. But a lot of the banks just said, all right, we're done at June 30th. We're not, we're just not going to take any more because this has been such a, banks are not able to do anything else but process PPPs. They can't even make like hardly make other loans because they're tied up with these PPPs. And it's also tied up a lot of their capital. Uh, banks aren't bottomless pits of money, regardless of, you know, what we like to think sometimes every bank has a cap rate, you know, they only worth so much money. Uh, and once, you know, you know, they're only legally allowed to loan so much money based on their cap rates. Once they start to get closer and closer to that with the, you know, amount of, you know, loans that are on their books, they have to stop loaning money. Um, you know, until that those start getting paid back down. So there's a lot of intricacies around banks and why they would not accept more PPPs. Uh, but there are also some out there uh, that are accepting PPPs. Um, you've got a lender list here. This is actually on the SBA website. So if you went down, you know, it's a long list. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's far down there. South Carolina's on there. And it'll tell you all the, the South Carolina lenders that are um, accepting PPPs. But like I said, and like the, uh, um, uh, the slide says, you know, start with your regular bank and then go from there. Um, there is a, I just went on Google too. Uh, there are people still taking it like cabbage, um, Square and PayPal normally take them, but they're not taking them right now. Those are both online processors and banks. Uh, but that doesn't mean they won't open it back up. It's just that, you know, all this just opened back up again. So they may start doing it again, but you know, you like go to cabbage here. Um, oops. You know, you can go to their site and apply for it here. It's online. Um, usually a pretty easy application. But like I said, I would always start with uh, your own bank first. Um, focus on working with smaller institutions. Uh, get your documents together before you start the application. Because they're going to ask you, you know, about your payroll. So you need all your payroll records together. Uh, and your tax returns if you got them. Um, processor records, bank statements, so forth and so on. Keep good time. Can't, can't stress this enough. We just got off a call with the bankers and they, they reiterated this in that keep good documentation of how you spend the money and what you use the loan proceeds for. Um, because you're going to need that when you go to apply for forgiveness. So anything else that I missed there, Bernita, before I get a little bit more into the forgiveness? No, uh, just a couple things came to mind quickly. Um, so with regard to, and we talked about this previously with the idle amount that you take, um, just be advised that per the SBA, we had a webinar with them yesterday. Um, if you decide to take less than the amount that they offer you, you cannot go back and change that. So whatever the amount is that you decide to take, just be certain about that before you actually click to accept an amount. And I think, I'm sure Jim is going to talk about this at some point, but if you do decide to take an IDLE and a PPP loan or PPP grant, whatever you want to call it, if you're going to apply for forgiveness, just make sure that you are very careful with how you're using those funds and that you don't commingle and that you show that each product was used for the specific purposes. So when they request documentation from you, you can show that funds were used for the approved purposes for each product. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Bernita. So I don't, I don't want to get too deep into forgiveness. Um, and the reason is this, I can actually email out this guide to PPP forgiveness. The reason is every bank processes your PPP loan 
and they will also process your forgiveness paperwork. So like Synovus Bank or Wells Fargo or First Citizens Bank or whoever the bank is in your area that you dealt with, they're all going to have a different approach to processing your forgiveness. And most of them will set up an online portal where you'll just go online and they'll ask you questions and you'll answer the questions and you may have to submit documentation and then that will be submitted to the bank and they'll review it. And if they have questions, then they'll probably come back to you or if they need more information or more documentation, they'll probably come back to you. And then once they feel comfortable with what they received, then they'll send it on to the SBA and then the SBA will make their determination and then they would come back based on what you've submitted and based on the rules and they will forgive, you know, whatever percentage hundred up to a hundred percent of the loan. So just quickly going back over those, you know, stipulations that you have to follow, you know, you know, that at least you have to spend 60% on payroll and 40% on utilities or mortgage interest or rent. If you spend the money on anything else, a working capital, you know, uh, other debt vendor debts, uh, equipment that you wanted to purchase, those are ineligible, you know, they will take that out of, you know, however much money you spent, they'll take that out of the calculation and, you know, they'll figure out how much you owe or what, what your loan's going to be. <clears throat> for, for example, if, you know, if your loan was $10,000 and you spent $9,000 on payroll and rent and utilities, uh, and you spent a thousand dollars on a piece of equipment that you needed, yeah, but the money was there, you know, and you used it for that uh, purpose, then your your loan amount will be a thousand dollars with a five year term at one percent. So terms are great, um, but if you do if you do want it all forgiven, you know, you just have to follow the rules. Uh, so got to spend it on payroll and the, the other items. And then the other thing is, if you don't, let's just say you had ten employees, but you only hired back six because you know you're just having a reduction of workforce but you claim 10 employees and you claim the payroll based on 10 employees but you're only wanting to run six now <clears throat> well there's going to be a percent reduction in your forgiveness based on you know six employees versus 10. i don't know exactly what the percent drop will be but they have a formula for it um you know and th there will be some reduction there because you didn't retain all the employees uh, so, I mean, th those are, you know, th there's a couple of, the, you know, intricacies to it, but, uh, you know, it's going to be with the banks. Um, you know, it's not so, you know, whenever you went and got the PPP loan or if you're going to go get the PPP loan, it's kind of like a rush to get it, you know, uh, to get the money out because they didn't know how long it was going to last and all that, but they're not rushing so much on the forgiveness, you know, it's just like, that'll be not such a speedy process, just uh, you can get to it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, get that in, you know, through their, through their systems and whatnot. So uh, PPP forgiveness is, is interesting. Um, like I said, it's gonna be different with whatever bank you work with and they're all gonna have different systems of how they uh, go about that. <clears throat> Oops. So now I'm at the end of the presentation. So we've gone a good little while here over an hour and uh, hopefully I've answered a lot of the questions, but if you have more questions, feel free to ask us at this point. Thank you, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Platt. Um, we do appreciate that. So if there are any questions from any of the attendees, um, please feel free to ask those questions now. Um, there were two questions that were posed in the chat. Um, Ms. Platt was able to answer one. 
Um, that question was, if funds are deposited into your account, how would you know if it's a loan or a grant? Um, and her response was, if it's a grant, it will typically show up blindly in your account as a deposit from the SBA. If it is a loan, you should receive an email invitation from the SBA to create a portal. Once you create that portal, you will see the amount they have approved for you. From that point, you will select the amount you would like to take up to the full amount and complete the process to sign the closing documents. And the second question that we received um, from one of the attendees is, can you apply more than once if you have two businesses? Um, so for example, the person asking owns one business and is considered a contractor for the other business. Um, so could that person apply more than once if they have two businesses? With the idle, I would probably say no. Um, it's not really designed for, it's really designed for, I mean, just one business. And I mean, if you own multiple businesses, it just depends on, I guess, the, the size of the business and the activity of the business. But if you're just a, you know, subcontractor for another business, I, I don't know. What do you think, Bernita? I would say to go ahead and try it. Um, just because if you're using two different tax ID numbers, then you are essentially two separate entities. Now, it's not saying that it's going to work, um, but they are looking at it on an entity by entity basis. So I would try. The only thing you have to lose is you don't get it. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions from attendees? There's a question in the Q&A about cost of goods sold. So your cost of goods sold is basically what you have into a product that you're selling. So if you're selling a widget for $10 and you pay $5 for it, um, then that's your cost of goods sold that you have in that particular product. Yeah, and, and I think I mentioned before that services usually don't have a cost of goods sold because they're associated with products and not services. So if you're selling a product, like uh, Bernita mentioned, like a widget, um, you had to buy it um, from somebody, <clears throat> a vendor, and then you resold it, unless you made it, and that's, that's a little different. Okay, I am monitoring the chat box and don't see any other questions that pop up. Um, as we're waiting for, for some more questions, um, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Platt, if you could please, um, if you could give out your contact information, should people have any follow-up questions um, after we, we finish on tonight? Yeah, so should have the contact information on the screen here. Uh, you've got my email address here and Bernita's and Janet, which is also in the, same office as Bernita. So probably the best way to contact us is through email since we're all at home uh, right now. <clears throat> but you can also go to um, the state website, which is scsbdc.com. And if you go to our main website there, you would be able to find information on the local um, area uh locations are you are you going into the office bernita i don't think so okay. i think we're still doing as much remote um as possible yeah, um, we and too. with respect to the question that we had about the independent contractor as well as um the business we can reach out to our sba area manager to see if he has an answer specifically to that question and i'm happy to get back to I'm assuming Sharice, um, and I can email her just to give her any feedback that he has. Um, but if whomever the person that asked that question, if you could email me your specific question, that would help me just to make sure I don't relay any wrong information to him when I ask him that. Yes, Bernie, you can email me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it looks like we, we do have a question. Um, um, the question is with ownership 
with the ownership percentage question on the EID, EIDL application, if I am the sole member of my LLC, would the percentage be 100% yet the personal be zero? Um, it will not allow anything more than 100%. Yeah, I mean, you should be, a sole proprietor would be 100%. Thank you for that question and response. Are there any more questions? And once again, for the attendees, the uh, email addresses for our presenters tonight are, are on your screen. Um, and also uh, Ms. Platt's email address has just been placed in the chat box. Yeah, if, uh, I'll just add that <clears throat> You know, if you hadn't, if you haven't had the opportunity to apply, um, you know, I would definitely encourage you to go ahead and apply. Like Bernita said, you know, the worst that could happen is, you know, they don't offer you a loan or they don't give you anything. But also, I think I mentioned earlier that as we've moved along, you know, they've become more and more lenient uh, on a lot of this stuff. So you know, definitely encourage you to do it um, because you need all the help you can get for your business these days, for sure. All right, thank you for that. And seeing no more questions, I didn't know um, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Platt, if you had any closing remarks before we adjourn today's webinar. Go ahead, Bernita. Um, I don't thank you guys for having us. If there's anything that we can do for you in terms of assisting with your small business, whether it's COVID related or not, um, please visit our website. We do provide confidential no cost consulting and you'll see the link to complete that confidentiality agreement there. And the website is www.scsbdc.com or you can reach out to us via email and we're happy to talk further with you about how to go through that process. Yeah, and I'll just add that, you know, our consultants are, you know, trained and have skills to help you with more than just applying for loans. Um, you know, we, we help with marketing, um, accounting. <clears throat> Bernita's got an accounting background and uh, education um, and uh, all aspects of business, really. So definitely give us a call. I mean, just as a sounding board. At, at minimal, you know, somebody to talk to. A lot of times it could be lonely being a, a small business owner. And um, sometimes you don't always have somebody to talk to you or, or your spouse might not want to, um, you know, react the same way as an objective third party. But that's what we're here to do. We're a resource, resource for you. It's no charge. And um, we're, at, we're out to try to help you the best we can. And we appreciate you asking us to be on here. Um, Anytime uh, you want us to uh, help out with these things, just let us know. We have other resources and specialists in the network that we can bring on, you know, if it's, a, if it's another uh, particular topic that you're looking for as well. And th thank you very much, um, both for your time and for your expertise and all you do to um, help out our small business owners here in, in the state of South Carolina to be as successful as possible. Um, once again, we would like to thank all the attendees for being here on tonight. Um, once again, um, on behalf of uh, the CMA Board of Commissioners and our Executive Director, Dr. Dolores DaCosta, I would like to thank everyone for participating in today's session. Uh, once again, should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact uh, Mr. Johnson or Ms. Platt. We once again want to thank them for their time and their expertise. Um, also, should you have any questions or need from the Commission for Minority Affairs, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, our website is cma.sc.gov. Um, once again, thank you everybody for coming out and we hope that everybody stays safe and uh, continues to wear their mask and socially distance during this time of pandemic. Uh, once again, uh, thank you and have a good evening.